and welcome to Learning From Home. Now you may have come to Sirkin Robinson's YouTube channel expecting to see him. Um, I am not him, you may have noticed. My name is Kate Robinson and I am his daughter. As well as that, myself and my partner Anthony work very closely with him on a number of projects, including this one, Learning From Home. Uh, we are producing this podcast together. So across the series and across other videos on this channel, you may see either me or Anthony uh, together or alone or with SKR. And you will also notice that we call him SKR. And this is so that I don't have to say either dad or Sir Ken, professionally speaking. A couple of weeks ago, SKR had the privilege of speaking to Julie Lithcott Hames. For those of you who are unfamiliar perhaps with her work, Julie was a former Dean of Students at Stanford University. And from her time there has written a number of books, including the New York Times bestselling How to Raise an Adult, which explains the rise of helicopter parenting and overparenting and the impact that is having on our kids. Since Julie and SKR spoke, there have been a number of monumental events that have taken place. The first was the devastating and completely unnecessary murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis police. And the second is the response to that through the protests that have been happening both in America and globally. Now, in addition to her work on parenting, Julie is also an incredible speaker and writer about matters of race. Her book, Real American, details her experience of growing up in the US as a biracial woman. We felt it was important to bring Julie back and speak to her in the context of everything that is going on. So we will be releasing her other conversation with SKR shortly, but this is a different conversation that you're about to watch. Ideally, it would have been SKR speaking to Julie himself. Um, unfortunately, he's been a bit under the weather. He's fine. He's on the mend and uh, it's nothing COVID related, but he wasn't well enough at the time to come on camera. So he asked if I would speak to her on his behalf and it was my absolute honor to do so. You'll find watching this video that we have chosen to release it primarily unedited. And that was because we felt it was hugely important that everything Julie said be heard. So please do forgive any technical glitches that happened. Um, we are in the era of Zoom interviews and uh, Zoom connections, but I trust that they won't take away from the power and the impact and the importance of what Julie discusses and what you're about to watch. Thank you. Um, okay. how, how are you guys though? Are you all keeping safe since, since you spoke to dad? We have been safe from pandemic and yeah. I'm African American and I am frightened, exhausted, um, raw. Um, I write on race in addition to parenting. My most recent, yay! <laughs> You're going to read all about my British family in there. There's yeah, a lovely backstory on my family. It takes up about 12 pages. Um, not right at the beginning, but early in the book. So you'll read about my British mother. And um, yeah. So anyway, so yes, uh, my most recent blog was called I Shudder, Do You? And I wrote it about a week ago. I published about a week ago. Um, I was, I had planned two weeks before that to write about race right. and, um, and race and kind of what the pandemic was revealing about systemic inequality in America. And then as I was writing it, I mean, you know, as a content producer, how this happens, there was that awful woman in Central Park in the heart of New York City who called, who threatened to call the police about a black man, right? Yeah. Which is using that white, you know, that historically, that's what you know, too many white women have chosen to do in America, in fiction and in life. Um, so that happened. So I was like, oh my gosh, you know, so I'm sort of revising. And then George Floyd was murdered. And I just couldn't, you know, I, one of the, when I posted it, one of my posts said, the writing can't keep up with the events. You know, like I, my writing was just out of date the minute I published it. So what I published one week ago says nothing about protests, riots, you know, the whole concept, of, right? It's just incredible how things have changed. Um, and the outpouring of love from around the world brings us to tears. And so this is, this is an incredibly hard time. Yeah. So remind me what we're talking about. Well, about we, that, about that okay, okay. Um, I, I've got two questions for you. Um, and so 
The first is, well, both questions are around the role of parents in this. Mm-hmm. Um, because we know that, and I'm ashamed to admit that I was surprised to learn this as a, as a mother, I should have known this, but that children make decisions based on race as early as my daughter is at around, you know, just before two years old. Um, and I know there was a school of thought in the past that we should avoid talking about race because we draw kids' attention to it or sort of make it a thing. Um, but obviously we know now that that's absolutely not the case. Um, so my first question was that really in, in for parents, for families who want to be the change that they want to see in the world, you know, it's easy to assume that if you think of yourself as, as not racist, and that's not even taking so far as being anti-racist, but if you just make the assumption that you yourself are not a racist, you'll raise non-racist children. Um, which clearly isn't the case. So my, my first question, if you're happy to answer it, is as somebody A, who writes about race and B, who writes about the role of parents, how can parents address this? How can parents be the change they wish to see in this situation when it comes to starting at home? I think the first thing that I want to say is let us not presume everybody listening is white. Sure. So let's have this conversation in a manner that is inclusive of all listeners. Absolutely. And the reason I point that out, and I'm not saying you you are presuming your audience is white, but I I do this deliberately as a writer who draws attention to the implicit presumption that whiteness is the norm and we we need to, you know, what, what are the white people experiencing? For listeners of color, what they're saying right now in their heads as we have this conversation is, I don't have the luxury of not talking to my children about race. Right. For those of us who are of color, and I can only speak to the American experience, but boy, can I speak to the American experience. Mm-hmm. I learned as a three-year-old, maybe a four-year-old, that something was wrong with my black daddy and possibly also with me. How did I learn that? From the looks on the eyes of strangers as my father and I walked down the street. I couldn't have called it racism, but I knew I should be afraid of that look. It was what I call the white racist sneer. I call it that now as a grown woman. As a young child, it simply made me very afraid. Being biracial, I had this perspective also of having a white parent and nobody looked at her that way when we walked down the street together. Now she got looks that what I call more subtle. She got looks that I could later label as pity and disdain. Those who don't like the thought of a white woman, you know, giving birth to a brown child, right? So I learned about racism from the looks of strangers on the street. Mm-hmm. I knew something was wrong with daddy and not with mommy. All right. This is what we learn young. And parents of children of color have to do this really hard work of trying to instill, first and foremost, you are unconditionally loved. You are precious. You're worthy of kindness and love and dignity. All parents need to do that. Mm -hmm. Parents of color, parents raising children of color also. And our dual task is to prepare our children to go out into a world where some people are going to presume that simply because of the color of their skin or their features that something's wrong with them or that they're bad or that they're criminal or not smart, etc. We have to kind of really thread this needle. So we got to talk to our kids about race, right? So the notion that, oh, we shouldn't talk to kids about race, don't make it a thing, that's a (laughs) fantasy in white people's eyes and minds. And I understand it because you want to duck an issue that is uncomfortable, but hey, folks, time is up. This is so uncomfortable. People yet again are losing their lives. And racism is in the heart and the mind. Mm -hmm. And we have to raise a next generation of humans who do not have this pernicious, violent tumor called racism in their hearts and minds. And yes, we must start young. Right. Now that probably feels like a preamble to the question you were actually asking, oh, no. uh, right? So, uh, so we got to talk about it because kids, as you pointed out, kids notice, we know from the research, uh, there's something called same race preference that infants show. And this isn't a racial bias as in those people are bad. It's simply 
infants in studies look at faces that resemble the faces they're accustomed to seeing in their own household. So they're already drawn to difference versus sameness, incredibly young. Here's the thing, there is nothing wrong with difference. In fact, our remarkable differences as a human species are, are beautiful and real and valid. Our trick, our task, is to ensure that our children do not attach value labels, value judgments to those differences. It's fine that you know who you are and you know what your parents look like, but when children start to learn, oh, we're normal, they're not normal. We're good, they're not good. We're hardworking, they're not hardworking. All of that is what my former colleague at Stanford, Jennifer Eberhardt, writes about in her amazing book, Biased which is about the implicit bias in all humans that gets heaped upon us by the society in which we've grown up. Um, and uh, we've got to undo that implicit bias. And, um, and the good news is we can. So, go, so that's how, if, if, you, if that's not too overwhelming a question, how, how do you begin to unwrite that? Or, or, or I suppose a, a first question being, where does it come from? I mean, in cases where it's not free, so speaking as a white mother with a white daughter who has a white father um, and, and two parents who identify as not being racist and who are working very hard to becoming anti-racist, actively anti-racist, um, where, where does that value attachment come? Yeah. So here I'm going to say, something that might seem rather obvious mm -hmm. which is but i think it's important to underscore it nevertheless as parents kate and i'm a parent too remind listeners i've got a 20 year old and 18 year old um as parents we are our children's uh biggest role model right whether we're their best role model is entirely subject to how we behave right mm -hmm. So we're their biggest role model, but are we their best? All depends on what? Us, okay? Um, where does racism come from? It comes from attitudes, beliefs, and so on. It comes from ignorance. It comes from lack of exposure to people who are different or very um, biased exposure to people who are different. Um, so some people say the antidote to racism is a passport. Get out and meet people around the world and discover you know, that our similarities are far greater than our differences and that all human beings um, want to be treated with kindness and dignity and, and all of us love our children and so on. Um, but at the level of what can we do with our two-year-old, not going to give your two-year-old a passport and send him on their own journey, right? Although you will bring yours around the world with you, I'm sure. Well, she is lucky enough to have a passport or two. But yeah. right? Exactly, as I was as yeah. a young child myself. Um, so I, I think what I'm saying is you got to, we as parents have to examine our own assumptions and presumptions, actions, behaviors, reactions. Our kids are listening to every word we say until they become teenagers <laughs> and they are watching everything we do. So we as parents have to ask ourselves, do I love black people? Now, Kate, that may strike people as a very weird thing to be asking oneself but i'm saying it today coming to you from america where we dehumanize black folk because we do not see black folk as equally human right and my work is about continuing to ask that question they they enslaved us because they didn't think we were human and i know i'm speaking to my former colonialist empire right. here not you but you know the uk right they enslaved us because we weren't seen as equally human. They ripped us from the arms of our parents and children on the auction block as we cried. Our cries were met with no mercy because they did not see our family bonds as rising to the level of their family bonds. And I'm talking about 400 and 300 and 200 years ago, but it all traces right up to the present, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a broad sweeping overview to get to the point of do you see black people as fully human? Everyone's going to be like, yes, of course, right? But do you? How do you know? How do you show it? Okay. When you see a black person, do you think stereotype, bad, evil, criminal, lazy, not smart, right? Does that stereotype come up for you? If so, it's going to prevent you from really seeing black folk as fully human, okay? 
Do you have black friends? Do you seek out places, organizations, opportunities to connect with people who are black? If the answer is no, this is the message you're sending your children. If you want your children to be anti-racist, you got to be actively doing the work of anti-racism, which, yes, includes reading important books and watching important documentaries and having the right conversations. But it also means asking yourself, why have I chosen to live a life that is entirely surrounded by white people? What's going on? I'm saying if this is happening for people, like interrogate that. Be curious about why that is. And there are valid reasons for the choices you've made. But ask yourself if I'm trying to show my child that I 100% value all humans, what am I doing to invite that truth into my practices and um, be curious about about places where I might have blind spots, okay? So um, that's how we do it. We role model for our children that we connect with black people and brown people and immigrants, you know, whatever the dynamic is, where you live, like show it. Um, Don't just be like racism is wrong, right? Show it by befriending and treating just as humanly as you would your own kind, you know, the people of color. Mm-hmm. You're right as well. Can I give you another example oh, of something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oftentimes the toddlers and, you know, the toddlers will call, will call out some stuff that embarrasses parents, right? right. It's like, you're in the supermarket or whatever y'all call it there, the grocery store. What do you call it? I think the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but my British mother, I'm always aware of like chips oh, and no, the we, fries we and the crisps and I was the chips and lorries yeah. and trucks and all that. Okay, so this is just me with we, my No, hand. no, we moved to America when I was 12. So I am, okay. I, I'm not the best person to ask myself because I slip between the two. <laughs> okay. But I'm grocery trying, store, yeah. But I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to demonstrate cultural competency. Right or your British listeners who might not understand this American. Um, <laughs> all right, so the kids in the supermarket, in the uh, shopping cart, in that little bat place that the toddler can sit in and face you, and your toddler all of a sudden goes, mommy, look, it's a mini maid, because your toddler has seen a maid who's got brown skin and sees a little person with brown skin and says, oh, a mini maid, and you're horrified. Right. You're horrified because your toddler has just said that in the supermarket, mm-hmm. right? Or your toddler says, why is his skin so dirty? Or, you know, right, these are all examples we could come up with of innocent questions toddlers ask because they're trying to make sense of their world. They're not racist. They're noticing differences. And, um, and so uh, here's what you got to do. You got to smile at your, make eye contact with the person, raise your eyebrows as if to say, I am really about to work on this. Okay? Right. Hopefully they'll return a smile. They may just look the other way. Who knows? Just focus on your own kid and say, sweetheart, um, human beings come with all different color skin. Some people have very, very dark skin, like a brownie, you know, or a piece of chocolate cake and or chocolate ice cream. And some people have very, very light skin, like vanilla ice cream. And some people are somewhere in between all of that. And every single human is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And um, look at your skin and look at mine. See, we're not the same color. Sometimes you might say that, right? Right. You just sort of diffuse. You don't worry that, oh my gosh, my child has embarrassed me. You like actually meet the child where they are and help them understand, you know, it's not dirt on that person's skin. It's just keep people come in different skin colors. And a mini maid, you can just say to your child with a smile, yes, our maid so-and-so has brown skin, but not all people with brown skin are maids. And in fact, some people with skin color like yours are maids. You just diffuse it kindly answer factually everybody listening will just be like hallelujah you know look at how that parent handled it okay that's an example and presumably it's not the moment to to freeze or try and shirk away from the conversation because that's it it start no exactly and then kids learn i said something bad but they might also intuit i said something true right that i'm not supposed to say Right. So we want to not well, freeze. Exactly. It's just like yeah. deep breath. Mm-hmm. You know, remember the examples from this podcast that you listened to and like, you know, deep breath and do it, sure. you know, and you're not going to get it perfectly right. I've had a lot of time to think about how I would respond if this happened, right? It takes practice. The better you, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'll feel relieved at having handled it 
well um, instead of having kind of shushed the child and scurried away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're and right. as people of color watching will be giving you, you know, a salute of like, right. good on you, thank you. Because they do, kids, I mean, watch everything. You're right, there's, there's the, you know, the, um, the Shakespeare phrase of don't speak of love, show me. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of it from having a toddler with things, you know, having a girl, a daughter with things like how I look at my, my body and my weight in a society that values, you know, women being a certain physical shape or type that it's not enough for me simply to say to my daughter that it bodies come in all different shapes and sizes. I have to model that for her and be comfortable with whatever shape or size my body turns into. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, you're right. They, they are sponges. Um, so then my, my next question, and thank you very much for that one, Bill, it, it's almost the same question again, um, but in the context specifically of the pandemic. So the, the podcast is learning from home and during the pandemic, um, you wrote in a blog on your website about how this situation is incredibly stressful, not just for adults, but for children as well. And if you've got depression or anxiety. Um, so my question for families now all being at home together um, and emotions already being very heightened and stresses being very high because of the pandemic. How can parents address this in a way, and, and not racism in, in general, but specifically the situation in America, the protests, um, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, the, yeah, the, um, the yet another murder, and then also the, the response of the government. How, how do you, and forgive me for bumbling through this slightly, but for, say, black children who once again are witnessing the fact that the system isn't there to keep them safe, who, who are experiencing what you've talked about there, this feeling like there might be something wrong with them or they're not worth protecting. And also then for children with privilege who perhaps this is the first time they've realized or they've been exposed to the fact that this is true. Um, and also then all the images of, you know, the cities on fire across America and the police and the tear gas and, and all of that. How, how, can, how can we approach this with, with children, all of us approach this with children in a way that is realistical and practical, but doesn't, I don't know, do, do you want to, do you know, how, that, that faces it head on within the context of children also dealing with other stresses and, um, and life being upside down as well? Yeah. Well, my first thought here, Kate, is um, one of gratitude that you're asking this question. Um, America is really hurting right now. And we've had tough times throughout our history, but Lord knows we have entered a new tough time. And it is scary. We are frightened. We are angry. We are worried. And um, to anyone listening who is not American, we need and are grateful for your commentary, your imagery, your bravery. You know, one day we may turn to you for evidence of what we did now. Mm -hmm. We may be called to account by the world and we need you to be recording what's happening. Whew. For children, obviously it all depends on their age, right? Right. They're old enough to be knowing about this. You know, they're not your two-year-old. They're not, you know, five. They're, they're older, probably. Yeah, I've, um, be, go ahead. I have a six-year-old stepson as well, do. Who, um, who we've been speaking to about this as well. Yeah. I mean, we want to be protecting young children from violent imagery. I remember when 9-11 happened here in the United States, I had a two-year-old and a six-week-old child. And that was the first day my two-year-old ever saw any videos because we plopped him down on the floor in front of videos and you know all of a sudden television was as long as it was videotape child programming it was fine he was in the other room while we watched the planes continue to you know fly into the world trade center and the pentagon and the field in pennsylvania yeah. so i knew that my two-year-old did not need to see that imagery um 
So there are things that very young children shouldn't be seeing. And my other caveat here is I'm not a I'm not a parenting expert. I wrote a book on what was going wrong with university students, and I, I don't really, two, six, nine, I'm not great at kind of telling you what's age appropriate. That's not my wheelhouse. Um, but I think at an age appropriate, in an age appropriate way, what we're increasingly doing is sharing facts and values with our children. The fact of what's happening, and then our values as a family around what we believe those things have to go together. So I think you've got to get super clear on what you believe. Um, people in my country right now are saying that, you know, Martin Luther King would never have condoned these, these riots. And, you know, Martin Luther King preached nonviolence, um, but he also knew that, um, that riots are an example of, you know, injustice having been uh, perpetrated over time, that people reach a boiling point. Um, we also know that the fascists who are white supremacist fascists are embedding themselves in the protests and starting some of the bad things, right? They are doing that on purpose. They live for these moments and we, you know, here we are. And so be smart about what's happening. And, you know, you have a set of people who are saying, Oh, the looters. I can't go into my favorite store. If you're more concerned about that than the fact that a policeman knelt on the neck of a black man until he suffocated to death, like figure that what's going on for you such that that life, again, are you seeing black people as equally human? Would you have tolerated it if it was a dog? Probably not. The world would be an outrage if he'd killed a dog on video by putting his neck against the dog's windpipe. Right, but it was a black man, so people like, well, you know, all right, like, come on, real I, opportunity to examine your own stuff here. I read something online, and it was uncredited. Otherwise, I would I would be crediting it, um, but it's not my words, but it it I resonated. Um, which is an example of white privilege is if you are saying something like, "It's a pity that a black man was murdered." But really, the looting and destruction of buildings has to stop. Um, yeah. Kind of invert those instead. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. a pity that the buildings are being destroyed, but really the killing of black men has to stop. Exactly. That's right. And let me say here, black men, the killing of black men tends to get um, um, the majority of media attention. Black women are losing their lives and black trans people yep. are losing their lives. And um, I just want to say that because often they are erased in this conversation. So um, I would say to children, um, um, there is a problem in um, society, not just America, yep. where um, for really a very, very, very long time, going back you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, um, some people feel that people with brown skin are not really human. And in some places, there's such a color hierarchy, the darker you are, the fewer rights you really have in the day-to-day -day sense. And the lighter you are, the more presumed you are to be smart and capable and entitled to whatever good things are coming your way. And at its root, that is what is, um, is happening and on display right now in America. And um, um, people are fed up um, and want America to be a place where everybody, no matter what the color of their skin is, just has a chance to lead a decent life and be safe. That's what every one of us wants for our children. Every, every white parent wants that. Every black parent wants that. Every Asian and Latino and Native and everybody, everybody wants that. Right. And that's ultimately what this is about. I will offer, you know, some people may be confused by the hashtag Black Lives Matter. There's the retort, all lives matter. The right. retort to that is, yes, if all lives did matter, we wouldn't need to be saying Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives clearly don't matter which is why we're saying that effectively we're saying can't black lives matter comma two. We're not asking to, we're not trying to be black supremacists. We're saying, can we be included in the set of humans to whom you offer dignity, kindness, the benefit of the doubt, uh, due process, justice, et cetera. Amazing. Thank you. Let me say something else for older kids. If your kid is 10, 11, 12, and has a friend uh, who is darker than them, and here I'm really speaking to all parents, um, regardless of your race, right? If your kid has a skin color privilege over one or some of their friends, 
I would want your kid to know that they might use that privilege out in the world. You can say, you know, here in our home, we know everybody's equal, but out in the world, some people don't believe that. And when uh, something bad starts to happen or there's some kerfuffle in a store or there's somebody is, a, you know, is too loud or whatever, when the authorities come, sometimes those authorities, if they're biased, think, oh, the darker skinned person must be the problem. And that's where you, as the lighter person, actually has more authority and power than you may realize. And that's where you can say, actually, officer, this is what I saw happen. And they're more likely to listen to you. That's a way to use your lighter privilege. And I'm saying this, if you're light skinned black person, and it's the darker black person who's assumed to have done the wrong thing, right? You can use your lighter skin privilege if you feel safe in the circumstance to actually clarify things. I'm horrified by videos right now of people asking the police to come deal with a store that's been looted in Los Angeles and the police show up and they, they handcuff the, the black people who are the store owners and, and the media are saying, no, 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 it's not them, it's them and pointing in another direction. Like you literally showed up, did your basic analysis of right and wrong and decided the black people must be the problem here. It's that embedded. So um, teaching our children how they can use their privilege to help others is important teaching our children of color how to be safe and smart out in the world. I just had to have this conversation with my 20 year old son last night. My community as much of America is under a curfew right now. My son loves to go, he's about to be 21 y'all. He loves to go for walks late at night, listening to music. It's just one of the ways he self-regulates and he was gonna go out last night and I said to him, I don't want you to, I'm afraid for you, but I can't tell you not to, you know, you're an adult. Uh, but please remind me that you know what to do if a cop pulls you over. And he reiterated, hands up, freeze. You know, if they ask me to put my hand to, for my ID to tell them I'm going to need to put my hand in my pocket to retrieve my ID. I mean, these are the things we have to teach black children in this country. And, um, and back to your original question about, you know, not talking about race with our children. It's yet another example of, I don't have the luxury of not talking to my kids about, about race. Right. Amazing. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I want to speak to multiracial families because I think we're in this weird, unique, sometimes wonderful, sometimes confusing situation. Because um, I mentioned my son, I, my I, so I'm this biracial black woman. My husband is um, white and Jewish. We have two kids. My son resembles me more and is slightly darker, has a big Afro, presents to the world as an, a light-skinned African-American. My daughter resembles her daddy more. And um, many people I've, I'm told don't know, quote unquote, that she's of color, that she has a black mother. And so to that child, uh, what I have to prepare her for and try to help her develop a strong identity around is the ambiguity. She could be in places where people say very awful things about people of color, not realizing basically she's one of them, right? And I've hoped to raise that child to feel such pride in her ancestry, all of its bits, including the fact that she's one quarter Yorkshire coal miner, um, in addition to African American and white, uh, Eastern European Jewish. Um, I want that kid to feel proud of all those ancestries, and I want her to feel that she can scan the room and decide, am I safe enough to speak up and say what needs to be said here? Mm -hmm. And I love it when she, she's 18 now, I love it when she shares examples of, you know, when she felt the need to say something. Because um, there's a pain in being so light or so your features are so ambiguous people don't realize and then they they behave as their awful selves around you in some ways she's probably going to be exposed to more uh, outright racism than i will because people tend to know better these days than to say that stuff in front of somebody like me but they don't realize it when they're doing it in front of my daughter so that's a pain she carries and she has to uh to sort of decide what to do in each moment and i think for parents raising kids who are multiracial um and for white parents of kids who are multiracial, um, these are tasks we ask you to take on. We need you to stand up for us. Uh, and uh, uh, you can do that by calling stuff out. So, and that differs then presumably from the advice that you give your son. Yes, because my son is not going to have to, I mean, he, he might hear overt racism, but, um, these days there's such a politeness what people some people call political correctness they know oh we're not supposed to say those things right. but we also know a group of you know 
monoracial white people, you know, maybe telling racist jokes that still happens or making just really racist statements. And, and my daughter, it could be in a group where that starts to happen because they don't realize um, that she is herself multiracial. So, yeah. But there is one thing I forgot to say that I would love to just say, and if it works to be woven in, then great. Um, I, I, it's a personal story. And I know as a narrative writer that personal stories are the way to just help people get it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd just like to share this. Um, in trying to be the biggest and best role models for our kids, we have to examine our own assumptions. And my journey as a biracial black woman has been to understand that racism had a clamp on my spirit, on my sense of self from a very young age. And really that clamp grew a lot stronger and more oppressive as I became a teenager, um, had some unfortunate experiences. Someone called me the N-word and wrote it on my locker in high school. And I think I spent the next 25 years just trying to never be called the N-word again. So I was behaving in ways of, um, you know, just don't, don't upset the white people was kind of my modus operandi. And I came to appreciate, you know, in my late thirties that that was really self-loathing, that I was not okay being myself and trying to appease others who might be afraid of me or think less of me because of my ancestry. And I looked that bias embedded in my own psyche. I, I dared to look at it and notice it and call it out for what it was. And that allowed me to liberate myself from it. Um, literally, this is the work we have to do in our own minds. Oh, I see. I was stereotyping myself and other black people is what I'm trying to say, because racism had taught me to do that. And I finally called it out for what it was. And it began to release its grip on me. And, you know, instead, I'm now infused with the self love and this feeling of love and compassion toward black people. Um, and I'm just sorry it didn't happen sooner in my life, but I say this to white listeners listening, you're hearing a black person say, I was biased against black people. Racism had taught me that, okay? And I was ashamed that that was true, but it is true, and it's true for so many of us. So don't be ashamed, just commit to doing the work. And here's my personal example of doing the work. When you're about to interact with somebody, when you see somebody, you know, you're, you're at a store, you're having lunch, you're, you know, out in the world, you're at, been asked to meet with somebody to give a job interview or to teach a class. And you see people who look different than you. And you, if you can develop a practice where you notice your own stereotype coming, you know, if you can start to say to yourself, Hey, I'm about to stereotype that person. Cause maybe, you know, they're, the garb on their head is about a religion. I don't understand very well or agree with, you know, or, their manner of speech or their apparent socioeconomic class or their skin color or what the language they speak, you know, um, notice that the stereotype is coming in your mind. Say to yourself, hey, I'm about to stereotype that person. Let's not do that. You're having this internal dialogue in real time, silently. <laughs> I'm about to stereotype this person. Let me not do that. Let me treat this person as if they are me. Take a deep breath, put a smile on your face, and you will be infused with more self-love. You will have a greater capacity to treat that person as a human being with kindness and dignity and respect, which is what we all want. That is my offering to listeners about what you can do in every single interaction with another human that will begin to alleviate, eliminate, rid us of these biases that are baked into our minds make people's days better, make our society one that is truly one of equality, liberty, justice for all.